Hello and welcome to Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I'm James Doherty, Senior Contributor at Daily Dead, and this week's episode is a special festive edition as we celebrate Stephen C. Miller's Silent Night, a killer Santa movie that turned 10 years old this month. Silent Night is a loose remake of 1984's Silent Night, Deadly Night, a movie that has garnered cult status. This was partially due to the fact that it was pulled from movie theatres after complaints from the Parent Teacher Association, who felt that depicting a killer Santa and running adverts during family-friendly shows was enough to place the filmmakers and TriStar Pictures on the naughty list. Although both the original and the remake feature Santas who murder people on Christmas Eve, the similarities end there. The remake substitutes an 18-year-old who is driven to murder because of past trauma with a Santa who has no backstory, no identity and seemingly no motive. In Silent Night, Santa visits a small town in Wisconsin where he unleashes carnage on the unsuspecting community. Armed with a sack full of weapons, including a flamethrower, he targets victims he deems naughty. It's up to Officer Bradamore to track down the renegade Santa before more of the townsfolk come to a bloody demise. Silent Night didn't have the controversy of the original, but it did manage to forge its own identity when the horror remake boom of the noughties was starting to wane. During this podcast, you will hear from director Stephen C. Miller, producer Shara Kay, and actor Malcolm McDowell about the making of Silent Night. Holiday horror movies are always popular, from Christmas Evil to Gremlins. Everyone has their favourites. So it was only a matter of time before classic festive horror movies of the 70s and 80s were remade for a more contemporary audience. In 2006, the remake of Black Christmas was released, and it was roughly around this time that Stephen C. Miller was attached to direct the remake of Silent Night, Deadly Night, although he had to wait some time before the movie could actually be made. I was actually up for it several years before, around 2006 or seven. And it was uh, originally a much different version of the movie, a much different script. Uh, we went a long ways in the process. Then it, then it went away. Um, and I think the rights got all tangled up. There was a bunch of issues. And then when Dimension got it back, they kind of didn't know what to do with it. And so they handed it off to uh, a guy by the name of Saperstein. And he called me saying, hey, I got the rights. What do you think about coming back to the project and uh, I liked, I liked him a lot. So I was like, yeah, let's, let's try it out and see if we can get it going. So uh, that's where it started. Working alongside Richard Saperstein was producer Shara Kay, who states that the success of the original was a big factor in remaking the movie. It was a great, it was a great concept, you know, that the title had such staying power and and a cult following of its own. And we felt it was, uh, you know, such a, good IP for to update and reinvent for a new generation. However, some of the original plans for the remake had more of a supernatural element to them, and even James Wan was getting in on the action. In the early beginnings of developing this one, Jason Rothwell, who wrote the script, we had talked about like various different versions of this movie, and at one point this movie was supernatural. Uh, we were going to go supernatural with the movie, and James Wan was involved, um, and James had come on and really wanted to make a killer Santa Claus movie. So me and James developed a whole version of the movie where he was a thinning Santa Claus who becomes fatter by eating all the kids in the town that are naughty. Uh, and uh, it, was an ins- it was kind of a batshit insane Santa Claus movie, um, and we were all for it. But at the end of the day, for some whatever reason, the higher up, People did not connect with it. Um, and then James's movie, uh, Insidious, came out and all hell broke loose. But then we went and then Jason and I came back with something we felt was, uh, was just as fun. And even though Stephen C. Miller's and screenwriter Jason Rothwell's approach didn't lean into the supernatural, Stephen was keen that his version should be fun. You know, if you remember remakes at that time, it was like The Hills Have Eyes and stuff like that, which was like intense and they really wanted Silent Night to be more intense than fun. Um, and that was the original plan. And then when they brought it back, um, you know, I really tried to lean into more of a fun aspect as well as Carnage. Because, you know, I liked the original a lot, but I also felt like it's always difficult to take Santa seriously no matter what. So I wanted to lean into the more camp aspect of it and more 80s aspect of it than 
the serious, it's got to be about, you know, trauma aspect of it. And I, I didn't, I really wanted to stay away from that. The concept seemed to be finalized, but it was also a case of making sure all the pieces of the puzzle were in place. I think the concept was pretty close to what it ended up being. And then we were, we worked on each of those killing, each of those slangs being, you know, who were, who, right, who's going to get punished and how are we going to track the Santa and how are we going to make that investigation satisfying, but also keep up the scares and keep up the humor and, you know, take advantage of all of the Christmas tropes that we possibly could. The Christmas tropes may have been in place, but ties back to the original were not. It really only original um, kind of nod was Garbage Day. That was in there from the very beginning. Like Grandpa didn't exist. It was that was a after I think three or four drafts in that, you know, the studio said, hey, we need something to allude that this is the similar world um, as the original. And Grandpa was an easy target to, to throw in there. Yeah, I mean, of course, there were tons of notes coming down of like, well, why can't we do this? I just kept sort of vetoing everything until they just were tired of listening to me. Despite the nods to the original, which includes someone being impaled on a set of deer antlers, Stephen wanted to make sure his version had its own appeal. Look, I like remakes a lot, but I also like films that they're able to stand on their own and, and sort of do something different. And I think I went into it with more of a reboot mindset than a remake mindset. And I just wanted to make sure that it stood out as its own movie and wasn't trying to be a classic. I, you know, I was going in to make a cool movie about a killer Santa Claus because I loved the classic. Um, my mindset from day one was not to try to imitate or be Silent Night, Deadly Night and, and to be a movie that if someone out of nowhere had never heard of any kind of Santa Claus movie, picked this movie up and watched it, they would consider this its own thing. That's why we really went that sort of direction. One new inclusion in this instalment was that this particular killer Santa carried a flamethrower. And, according to Shara Kay, Santa was originally going to light things up a lot earlier in the movie. It was going back to like an early draft of the script. It had that backstory of Santa, like with the flamethrower right at the beginning. I was like, oh no, what we, I like how it ended up, you know, that come, coming later in the film because, you know, there's like a anticipation right and build up to that elements of silent night like many horror movies was influenced by real life events and killers and the idea of santa using a flamethrower came from a crime in 2008 where bruce jeffrey pardo entered a family house party dressed as santa and killed nine people using guns and a homemade flamethrower after hearing about the event stephen c miller wanted to incorporate using the flamethrower into silent night Jason Rothwell, again, the writer, brought that to my attention. We read it. I was like, this is intense. This is exactly what we should build the movie off of. That image of Santa Claus with a flamethrower was something I could not get out of my head after I read the article. And that's when I went back to Jason and said, this is this is where it has to go. Santa with a flamethrower is a beast. That, you know, that is a poster. That is the image. And if we can start there, where do we go from there? Um, and that that's that's what we did. However, Shara Kay wanted to let the audience decide. I think we like that idea of like, is it urban legend or is it urban truth? You know, I'm just kind of put it out there for the audience to decide. The shoot was to take place in Manitoba, Canada. And when Stephen C. Miller initially arrived, he discovered he was staying at the same hotel as someone who he wanted to cast in the movie. Stephen and Malcolm McDowell talk about their first meeting. Malcolm McDowell is a funny story. Like he was staying in the hotel. And while I was there, Malcolm was there shooting, I think it was Home Alone 5 or, or whatever the one was that he did. He was having breakfast and I just went up to him and sat down and said, we're making a movie here in the next couple months. Like I'm a huge fan of yours. I think you would kill it as our sheriff. And he was like, uh, sure. Just a happenstance that he was there. And like we had, he was one of the names we literally had talked about would be really fun to, to be in the movie. I also did this Home Alone movie for television at the same time. That was the one I was doing when I met Stephen. He went, hey, listen, what are you doing? And I went, I'm doing this movie. And he goes, hey, what are you doing in, in three weeks? And he, I think he said, do you want to uh, come and uh, do this? And I went, yeah, let me read it. Malcolm's agent even sold him on the idea that he didn't need to travel to a new location. My manager, you know, was said, look, you don't even have to go back. You just go from one set to the other. And I went, well, let me read it. And I went, ah, it's just kind of a fun little movie. Yeah, I'll do it. Nobody will expect me to pay the sheriff. 
And despite the fact that Malcolm McDowell had been in classics such as A Clockwork Orange, If and Caligula, he was still attracted to quirkier projects, especially if it was a good story. I was very lucky to be cast, actually, come to think of it. A little genre movie like that, you know, in playing, I didn't have to play a serial killer or anything like that. Quite nice. I like doing interesting little projects, and usually they're kind of offbeat and, you know, they're sort of interesting. So that's why um, I was drawn to this. You know, and I thought it was well written. I thought the script was kind of cool. And I just liked the whole claustrophobic thing of the town. You know, it was really cool. Now, even though Malcolm McDowell wasn't playing a serial killer, Stephen C. Miller had a very specific idea for Malcolm's character of Sheriff Cooper. When we talked about it, I was like, you've got to be like, you have to pretend that you are the most badass sheriff, even though you are not. It's very Scooby-Doo. I was like, we need to go that direction with it because I think you would crush it. And he was like, yeah, he had, he had a lot of fun with it. And because of Malcolm McDowell's respect for Stephen, he was happy to oblige. I was very happy to accommodate him because he was somebody that I respected so that I knew if he had an idea, I'm happy to listen to it and do it as, to the best of my ability. You know, if I could do it, I'd be happy to do it for it. And that's the way he saw the movie. So that was great. And yeah, he, do, he is a thinks he's a badass, but really he's not at all. Now, one thing, ideally, that a movie set on Christmas Eve needs is snow. And when Stephen C. Miller arrived in Canada, there was an abundance of it. But a delay in production created a bit of a problem. I actually got there in December, and we were in Winnipeg, Canada. And it was, I, it was completely snow. We were like, this is awesome, it's going to look crazy. January, and then they had money issues, and so production sort of halted. So I was actually living up there for a while, waiting for the movie to come back. And it didn't start coming back until late March. So we knew we weren't going to shoot till April, May. Uh, and by that point, the snow was gone, which was unfortunate. Even though a snowy winter scene would have looked great on camera, it would have been difficult to manage off camera. When asked how difficult it was to shoot the movie in spring, Shara Kay responded, like a lot easier than shooting in Winnipeg in the winter, which if you're doing that, it would not have been possible. A lot, there were a lot of exteriors on that movie, and that's just not would not have been possible in like in Manitoba in the winter. I mean, you know, you're shooting like long days, and and it's not conducive to getting great performances, you know, out of anybody if they're freezing. This may have been better for the actors, but Stephen found things a little trickier as he had to be more creative with his direction. It sort of like created a lot of my camera angles for me. If you go back and watch the movie, a lot of the camera angles are actually low angles pointed up at my characters to stay off the ground. Um, and that's because I just didn't feel like dealing with everyone saying there's no snow. I mean, we could not get around it in the tree farm sequence. It was just a massive, it was too hard. I mean, we tried to put some patches in places, but like the movie just didn't have the budget to carry placing snow everywhere in this movie you'll you'll see that the camera angles are fairly designed to not show the ground if you go back and watch 90 percent of camera angles are point are down at my characters so that way you get that you just don't really even think about it because the sky always looks cold and the, the trees hadn't hadn't fully bloomed nothing had happened yet so we still had the the dead sort of tree look so it was just very important and uh, really it was apparent to me at the very beginning like okay we can't show the ground or else we'll just be total, you know, in a mess here. Oh yes, the tree farm sequence. For those of you who don't know, the tree farm sequence features a half-naked woman running away from our killer centre through a motel and into a tree farm. She then has her leg hacked off before being fed into a wood chipper. Now that's a bloody good Christmas. When asked whose idea the murder in the wood chipper was, Stephen C. Miller was happy to take the credit. Oh, that's totally me. I mean, like a lot of a lot of the movies that I do, the scripts come in and my first order of business is to go through any action or kill scene sequences and completely put my stamp on them. Yeah, that was something that I knew from the very beginning I needed to get in there. Me and Jason had walked through sort of like tree farm sequences and I was like, well, if there's a tree farm, there's got to be, you know, a wood chipper. And if there's a wood chipper, we got to put a naked chick through a wood chipper. And that's it literally went from there. To designing the sequence to build to that um and so that character was born from us knowing we wanted to do that sequence although when filming this scene shara k got a lot of complaints from people staying in the motel 
However, there was another scene that could have garnered even more complaints. We definitely got some like nudity complaints from people at that motel <laughs> running a half naked uh, actress through the parking lot in broad daylight over and over again. And that was a particularly memorable sequence. At least the church, you know, Santa sling in a church was less public of an event. So we managed to not have any um, controversy over that. One thing people didn't complain about was Malcolm McDowell's ad-libbing, which is something he liked to do, to the point where he can't remember which lines were scripted and which were ad-libbed. Here is Stephen C. Miller and Malcolm McDowell with more. Anything with Malcolm was always a lot of fun because he would just come up with the craziest lines and we would just let him continue to do it. The avocado on the burger, like those kind of lines are like totally ad-libbed by, by Malcolm. Like he was just having fun with it. You know, it depends on what the part is, you know. If it needs a bit padding out, and, and I think I can improve it. I'll do it. See if the director likes it. If he likes it, I'll, I'll keep it in. You know, I'll do it in a rehearsal or something. I usually don't like to surprise them by doing it, you know, on a take. But I, I have been known to do it. If I'd seen the movie and, and you said, hey, is this an ad lib? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know because when you're in it, you're in it. However, there was one thing that Stephen couldn't let Malcolm ad lib on and that was using a flamethrower. He wanted to, to do the flamethrower at one point. Uh, he wanted to be the one to pick up the flamethrower and blast Santa with it. Uh, and we had to, like, pry it out of his hands. He wanted to do it so badly. It's like, like dude, you can't, you can't do it. Like, it's got to be this cut guy doing it because you're going to blow yourself up, bro. You know, it was just stuff like that that was a lot of fun. And even though Shara Kay can't remember that particular story, she can certainly believe it happened. I mean, Malcolm was great and such a professional, but I don't I don't remember the flamethrower incident, but it sounds it, it sounds very likely. And even though Malcolm had license to ad lib, he was disappointed that he couldn't ad lib with a flamethrower. Oh yeah, no, that was I was really bummed I never got to do that. I mean that would have been fun. They wouldn't let me because of safety, you know. But oh god, that would have been fun. Who doesn't want to fire a flamethrower. I would have done that happily. The flamethrower was only one of several weapons the killer Santa uses in Silent Night. Others include a cattle prod and a fire poker, which is used on a nasty bratty teenage girl who is approximately 14 years old. Even though the fatal moment isn't seen on camera, it was filmed. Here's Stephen C. Miller. It was a shot material. We shot it. Like, we killed her on screen. You know, I shot it. Uh, but that came back as like a no-no, um, and we can't kill a child that graphically on screen, which is fine. Um, but like, yeah, we we got a little pushback on that, and there was a little concern. But it, you know, it, it kind of just fell into like the Veruca Salt aspect of the movie, where it was like you feel like you're going to hate this character so badly that if she gets off, you're not you're not going to hate it too much. So that that was the uh, the feeling. And the killing of a character this age, as well as other deaths in the film, were carefully considered in advance. This is not a movie for children. I think we were uh, we were all on board with going there uh, with that with that one and several of the other vignettes really kind of like pushing the boundaries. Now, production seemed to go well after the initial hiccup of filming in spring. However, Another hiccup that caused a bit of a stink was the final showdown scene in the police station. After the killer Santa uses the flamethrower, the sprinkler system goes off. But it wasn't water that was being sprayed out. Here's Stephen C. Miller to explain. One of the funner things is, uh, you know, the whole ending sequence where the, the, sh the rain goes off inside the, inside the police station. Uh, me and Jamie had talked about it previously, like this whole thing was going to be in rain. And I guess whatever they plugged the rain up to ended up not being water, ended up being like some kind of sewage system. And it started to spray. And like Jamie's face was was like insanely like, what the hell is this? I was like, what the hell is that smell? Like, you know, we had to pull everybody out. We had to dry down the set. We had to have a whole protocol where they had to come in and do all the cleaning. Uh, and then redo it again and then you know rightly so jamie was like yeah i'm not going to be in that water so we had to literally carve out um a pathway for jamie to walk through but yet still have water falling in front of the frame but not effectively hitting her stephen c miller managed to finish the scene 
although there was more he was hoping to do with the showdown in the police station. Here, he talks about what else he would have liked to have done with the movie if he had a bit more time and a bit more budget. I really enjoy the movie. Like, I, I look back on it, and, like, if we had a few more bucks or dollars and the budget was a little bigger and we had a little more days, like, I think I would have loved to have carved out a bigger chase sequence in that tree ho- in the tree farm and made it a little bit more suspenseful and uh, probably would have liked to have seen a bigger ending in, rather than in the police station at one point it was going to be in a much bigger situation. So like it was actually de- during the, the uh, Christmas uh, parade and it was going to be much more of a bigger spectacle. Um, so I would have loved to have tackled something like that a little bigger. Um, but I think for what we had in the days, like it really turned out really fun. Uh, I thought everybody did really well. And I think for me, it was, I'm really happy with it. Stephen isn't the only one who enjoyed his experience. Here's Shara Kay with her thoughts regarding her time on the movie. It was a big cast and it was like a fun collaborative effort and really smooth production. We were, we, we ended up finishing ahead of schedule, I think by a couple days. Um, Steven was so efficient and we all, we had a lot of fun there. I have such fond memories of this one. I mean, it was like, as you can tell from watching it, probably like how fun it was to make. We had a, we had a great filming period. A lot of that is, is thanks to Steven Um, he was so enthusiastic and, you know, really brought a big cast and a, and a lot of storylines together into something. I think that's super fun and standing the test of time. And we couldn't leave out Malcolm, who along with Shara and Stephen really liked the finished product. I thought it was a good little movie. You know, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's hilarious actually. And, um, you know, it was a lot of fun doing it. I, I, always liked this movie and i thought it was very underrated and you know it, it's not pretentious it is what it is and it's a real well-crafted movie even though the movie didn't have a major theatrical release shara believes that this hasn't impacted its long-term popularity you know it didn't have a massive release but it got some very you know kind reviews right off the bat and i think it's built it's found its audience over time as opposed to all at once, right? So, you know, every year, you know, at the holiday season, we get, you know, online chatter and, and then people f- discover it again or discover it for the first time. So it's fun that it has that kind of perennial, uh, you know, seasonal appeal. Silent Night has certainly benefited from being a holiday-themed horror. And who doesn't like to see people murdered and bludgeoned just before Christmas? I certainly do. According to Stephen C. Miller, it's become a bit of a tradition. Christmas is a yearly thing, and and obviously people enjoy to watch people get murdered on Christmas for some reason. So it's like, you know, it goes hand in hand. It just has since the 80s. So uh, it's definitely something that I love seeing continue to have life. If you haven't already had your seasonal viewing of Silent Night, then what are you waiting for? Silent Night is currently on Shudder in the USA and on Amazon Prime in the UK. Make sure to like and subscribe to Corpse Club and leave us a review. I'm James Doherty, wishing you Merry Christmas and a bloody new year. Um.